1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, cry or crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sexual desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray together. Our Father, we come before you, and we humbly and simply ask that your word would go forth and accomplish all that you have set out for it to do, that it would not return empty and void. We pray that you would give the speaker wisdom and insight and clarity of thought, and that you would give the hearers uh, uh, ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, we pray that you would bless your people by your word as you have promised to do. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, a man named uh, Dr. George Dowling, I have trouble saying his last name, uh, once remarked in a sermon that habit grooves a channel in our brains. In other words, those little things that we do day in and day out, over and over again, those things that become habits to us shape who we are, how we act, how we think. You know, if you rise early every morning for work, it begins to shape you, us into morning people. Whether uh, you like that idea or not, it will happen to you. And when you hit the snooze button every day, it becomes a habit for how we react to the morning when it comes. The point that uh, Dowling is making, that what we do repeatedly shapes us. Very simply, that's his point. Repetition or habit creates a pattern that we follow, a structure in our lives, and our very identity, who we are, is shaped by these patterns that order our lives. Well, as we continue our series on worship this week... The question that we're looking at today is, are there any habits or structures in worship? You know, if worship, as we argued last week, is at the center of our existence, if it is the greatest activity of the church as we gather corporately into the very presence of God at Mount Zion, as we talked about, you know, if God really is a consuming fire and we are called to offer acceptable worship, what does that worship look like? Are there any guidelines given to us throughout the scriptures? Is there some pattern, some structure that is established, some order of worship or liturgy is another word for it, that we are called by the scriptures to follow as we worship God? Is there some shape or form to our service to take? And does that worship in turn then shape us and who we are by these particular habits that we follow? In other words... Does the Bible speak at all about the way that we offer worship to our God, or do we offer praise in just whatever way we feel like doing? Again, these uh, questions we're thinking about, they're not about style. <laughs> uh, we're not dealing with that. We're not talking about whether a guitar or a, a, an organ 
as a better instrument to worship. Uh, uh, it's not about pointing fingers at one another. There certainly are implications that will follow from these things, but that is not the focus. We're simply asking the question, if God calls us to offer acceptable worship to him, how do we know what that worship ought to look like? Well, the first thing we need to see this morning is that our worship is covenantal worship. Our worship is covenantal worship. And we're going to be all over the place in the scriptures this morning. I'll admit that at the outset. Uh, we're trying to do an overview of the patterns found. Whose children are those? We're trying to do an overview of all the patterns found throughout the whole of the Bible. So that you can see that it's not just Pastor Shane uh, making this stuff up in one single isolated passage. But these patterns come from all over the place. So just bear with me. We'll get back to, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, what does it mean when we say that our worship is covenantal? What is the point behind that? It's a fairly big word, one we don't use on a regular basis, right? You know, but it's a very biblical word, this concept or idea of covenant. Well, as you go through the scriptures, God always meets with his people by way of a covenant. God created man and he designed him and he designed man to commune with him, to have a relationship to worship him and the means by which that communion, that relationship, that worship can take place is always in the scriptures by way of the covenant. All that covenant means is it is the way that God has communion with man, that God has indeed come down and is willing to meet and bless man and the place that he does that is in covenant, in the promises that are given throughout the scriptures. In Genesis 3, with Adam, we see this when he has sinned against God and he has turned away from him. This breach that was torn between God and man that is irreparable. Man could no longer commune with a holy God because of his sin. And yet God comes down and he makes a promise to Adam that he will repair that break. That he will bring man into his presence again. He will do so by way of a son who will crush the head of the serpent God makes a promise, in other words, and he makes a covenant with Adam in order that sinful man might be able to commune with him and worship him. That is the goal of these covenants that are given throughout scriptures. God always comes to man by way of a covenant to commune with him in order that he might be worshipped by his creature. And so we see this pattern throughout the scriptures. God comes to Abraham in Genesis 12 and he makes a covenant with him saying, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and your name will be great and all the families of the earth will indeed be blessed through you. God promises these things to Abraham. He covenants with father Abraham, bringing the blessing of God upon him. And Abraham is changed through this covenant relationship. His whole life will be one that is marked now by communion with God and worship of this God because God called him and initiates this relationship between him. God works this way throughout the whole Old Testament. And what he did then is still true in the New Testament or the New Covenant is another way to say it. You know, that's the same word used for testament and covenant. When you come to the New Testament, it is the same concept here. And indeed, we come into the New Covenant. We see this when Christ celebrates the Passovers with his disciples. He, what does he say? This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. What he meant by that is, now I am the way. That man can have communion with God. I am the way to have communion with the Father. By my blood, man will have relations with God again. To be able to worship him rightly as we were created to do. And the point, as you follow this covenantal structure that develops between God and man, is that you begin to see a pattern unfold throughout the scriptures. This pattern that should orient our worship as we enter into relationship with him, for one thing, you'll notice over and over and over again, God always initiates the relationship, doesn't he? He always starts the worship of himself. In other words, God first calls you 
to worship him. That's the first step of worship. God calling his people to himself. And thereby we ought to praise him. And he demands that of us by the very nature of his calling us. But that's, there's more than just that. That's just the first step in the whole process that we see. Consider Exodus 19 and 20, that section of scripture where we read this morning. Here's where you, you, you really find a helpful pattern that unfolds elsewhere in scripture. God has now brought the people of God, his children, his beloved ones. He has brought them out of Egypt. He has delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh up from the house of bondage. And in Exodus 19, as God is preparing to covenant with his people that he has set his love upon, that he has sought after and bought, in verses 9 through 11, we see God call this people to himself. God says, behold, I am coming to you in thick cloud and smoke that the people may hear when I speak to you. In other words, I'm coming and I'm coming to meet with my people. I'm coming to you who are assembled before me. And what's the very next thing that we read after that? Therefore, tell the peoples to consecrate themselves, to wash their garments, to get ready for this meeting. In other words, this people I'm calling, they need to be cleansed. They need to recognize that they are entering the presence of a holy God, that they are sinners before a holy God who is a consuming fire. And so they have, uh, so have them wash themselves, ceremonially becoming clean. Often in scriptures, we see this pattern when God calls people into his presence, into the presence of the living gods. They see God and who he is in all of his glory and splendor. And the first they, they realize about themselves as they enter into his presence is, Lord, I am unclean. I'm unworthy to enter your presence. I am a sinner. Isaiah in chapter 6, when God is calling him into his throne room, immediately he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner before a holy God. What do we do now? He knows he should not be there, that because of who he is, he should be kept away from God. And yet, what happens next? Well, God cleanses him. He cleanses his unclean lips with a burning coal. He declares him clean so that he does belong there, so that he can have communion with God, so he can enter his presence. You'll notice, uh, uh, so he can worship and serve the living God. And this happens all over the place. We see it in Exodus 3 with Moses when he comes before this burning bush that he, uh, he can't understand what is going on. And yet, as he draws near, God speaks to him and he says, you are walking on holy ground, remove your sandals. And what is the first thing that Moses does? He hides his face. Why? Because he knows himself to be a sinner in the presence of a holy, living God. And he cannot see God and live. And both by his actions, these actions of Moses, of hiding his face in Isaiah, just these two examples, but they're all over the place. We see sinners who come into the presence of God confess, in fact, that they are sinners by word and by their actions. And then we see them cleansed of their unrighteousness. And what do we see in Exodus 19 here? In verse 14, what is it the people are called to do? They wash their garments. And by their actions, they confess they are sinners in need of cleansing. They ultimately need to be cleansed, not because of this, and they are cleansed ultimately, not because of the ceremony. But because God has called them up, the Lord has brought them out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I brought you up from the house of slavery, the house of sin. I've brought you, I've bought you, and I have cleansed you, and I bring you into this new place, into a new situation from where you have been. So we see God call his people, he cleanses his people, and then he consecrates his people by his word. It's hard coming up with a single word that describes what's happening here, but I'll use it and hope you, you'll see what I mean before long. But notice that this sinful people has been called, they have been cleansed, and now they are able to enter into the presence of God. As soon as that happens, what does God do? 
Well, he gives them his word. He binds them to himself through his word. He calls them to live holy lives now by these words alone. And he calls them to be sanctified or conformed or comforted by these words set apart. And by these words, he will cleanse them. Throughout Exodus, he gives and continues to give these words. Words for several more chapters through the Exodus, but at the end of this particular ceremony where he is covenanting with his people at Mount Sinai, it comes to an end in chapter 24, where after consecrating his people, after making his people holy by his word, he communes with his people. After hearing God speak his word to his people, Moses sprinkles the people of God clean by the blood of the covenant. And then in the sight of all Israel, Moses and Aaron and the elders who represent the people, they sit down and the text tells us that they eat at the feet of God. They sit upon his footstool and God did not lay his hand upon the people of Israel. In other words, now what they have been called, now that they have been called and set apart as his people and cleansed and consecrated by his word, now God comes down to them, or in fact, he raises his people up to himself to commune with them, to have relation with them. And he sits them at his feet upon his footstool, allowing them to eat morsels from his heavenly banquet table. He draws them to himself over a sacred meal in peace. No harm will come to them as sinners enter into the presence of holy God. I hope you're hearing some echoes here. And I know this is Old Testament stuff. It's Old Covenant, but we are New Covenant people. And I hope you hear echoes of this covenantal language to another meal set for those who have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, who have been called by God and cleansed of their sin and consecrated by his word. Because that is the point. Our God is the same God of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. They surely uh, are different covenants. There are differences between them. But it is the same God. And we should not be surprised if some of these patterns that we see unfolding reflect our own worship or should reflect our own worship today. It shouldn't surprise us if we hear echoes into the New Testament. In fact, you will find all of those elements that we just listed in more in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter actually quotes from Exodus 19.6. He actually is quoting from that passage, making an explicit connection between these two groups. Notice verse 4. He says, as you come, because you were called, as you come, put away all malice. And all the seed, in other words, confess your sins, have them done away with, have yourself cleansed as you come before God. And long then what? For the pure spiritual milk that you may be built up. In other words, be consecrated by the word of God, that the word might strengthen you and support you. And verses 9 and 10, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen na- race. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. And God comes down and he communes with them in this place. Once they were far off, now they have been brought near and have communion and relation with God. What better way to express that than with a meal? Even as we just sang in our last song. You know that the children sit around the table and join their father at a meal. They commune with God in this place. And finally in Peter, God commissions them or he blesses his people and they go out into the world so that the world, in the world, all the nations of the uh, world might be blessed in them. Glorify God on the day of his visitation. This is a covenantal structure that you're seeing. You know, this is a pattern From the Old Testament being carried over into the New Testament, that worship is being here developed in such a way it is a covenantal pattern and structure. But as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, we see our worship isn't just covenantal, but our worship is temple worship. Now that should sound rather odd to you, uh, especially since we are not Jews. You know, our worship is temple worship. 
Peter speaks this talk, time talking about the temple, you will notice. But before we get there, you know, before we see what Peter is talking about as he draws us into the temple worship, what was the temple originally built for according to the scriptures? What was its purpose? What was the place where God called his people to assemble in order to worship him? It was the place where the whole people of God came to worship God corporately. And the priests would offer their temple sacrifice on behalf of the people of God. And in that temple, a pattern of worship emerges often as they come before a holy God. Come to 2 Chronicles chapter 5-7 through 7, where the temple is being dedicated. It's a great place to see this. In chapter 5, the people are first called to worship God at his temple. Then they offer sacrifices to their God in order to cleanse the people before God. Notice, by the sacrifice of the people, they are confessing their sin before God, that they are sinners, and God then accepts them and he cleanses them of all their unrighteousness. And in chapter 6, God's word is brought to God's people and his laws are set upon the people, consecrating them to himself. And in chapter 7, God's glory comes down and it fills the temple. God comes down and he communes with those who worship. And the people of God feast together with God and with one another. Again, what we are seeing is this covenantal meal where God communes with his people. And the people of God are blessed as they are sent away, and the text tells us that they were joyful of heart for how the Lord God is communing with the people of God. They are sent back to their homes, out into the world. They are commissioned as they are sent away and blessed by God. Well, if that's what Old Testament worship looked like, if this is the regular pattern, what happens when you come to the New Testament? Is the temple done away with? Is it eradicated? This is, a, 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 is this structure abandoned completely? No. What does Christ say about the temple? He says about his own body, he says, destroy this temple, speaking of his own flesh and blood, and in three days I will raise this temple up again. Temple worship hasn't been done away with. In the new covenant, we come to God and worship him there through Jesus Christ, who is the new temple. We come to God through a temple, but he is that temple. He is the only way to the Father. Even as Old Covenant Temple was the only way to come and to, uh, to God to be cleansed of our sin, to receive the means of God's grace, to have communion with God, so now we come to God because He calls us and He cleanses us in the body and blood of Christ. And now we are gathered up into that temple with Him. Notice this, what 1 Peter 2 tells us. Verse 4, as you come to him who was rejected, the living stone, who is now the chief cornerstone, like the foundational stone of this new temple. Now you, people of God, are being built up as a spiritual house or a temple, the place where God dwells. And how are you built up? By his word, as he consecrates you, as it is given, as it is sent out from him, it changes you and shapes you and it molds you into his temple. And as part of this living temple, you come as a holy priesthood, a holy nation. Again, that direct connection back to Exodus 19.6. He's saying, you people of God who gather in the name of Christ, whether you be Jew or Gentile, you come to the living God who dwells in the heavenly Jerusalem by way of the new temple who is Jesus. And you gather just as they gathered. Before our covenantal God back then, you come into the heavenly Jerusalem to worship God through this new temple who is Jesus. Our worship as Christians, people of God, is new temple worship. It has been fulfilled in Christ. What was shadowed and foreseen in that old picture has passed away and the new has come in the person of Christ. And people of God, when you gather, you gather as the temple and you are being built together stone upon stone into the spiritual house of God. You who are not a people are now called God's people. You are now God's house. You have communion with God. Isn't that what Paul tells us? Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You gather together and you are built into a holy priesthood by his word. 
in order to offer spiritual sacrifices, which is a reasonable service, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so as you are united to Christ, this one who is the new temple, as you are united to him by faith, if we are being made into a spiritual house, it shouldn't surprise us then that Paul, or excuse me, Peter and Paul in Romans 12 is using a language of sacrifice and priesthood here. Sacrifice was always a part of the worship of the temple offered by the priests. And here the whole people of God are being made into a holy priesthood who brings sacrifice to him. Not a sacrifice of bulls and goats as in the old covenant for Christ. Sacrifice, according to Hebrews, was once for all. It is far greater than these offerings. But we bring and we sacrifice ourselves. We present ourselves as living sacrifices before God. So just as Christ, as we are united to him who is the temple by faith, just as we become the temple through our union with him, in the same way as we are united to Christ who is our sacrifice for sins. So now our life, as we are connected to him, becomes a sacrifice to God with him. I know this is a lot to process. I know that I have taxed some of you this morning. Here's the point. Here is why it all matters. If our God is a covenantal God, as he is clearly shown throughout the scriptures, if God comes to man by way of a covenant to have relationship with him and that coming of God to man, we see a pattern emerge over and over again of God calling and confession of sin requiring cleansing, a word of God being given and communion with God being had over a meal as a result. And then he sends us away, blessing us and commissioning us out into the world, back to our homes, into the nation. If that patterns exist and we see it over and over and over again in scriptures in different ways, shouldn't that pattern affect our weekly worship, our liturgy, our habits? You're not being arbitrary or cranky here about this pattern. But if God over and over again follows this pattern for communing with him, there is just, then it is just possible that this pattern ought to inform our worship of him this day. I mean, that is the pattern God uses over and over again when he meets with his people. There is no other pattern presented throughout the scriptures. It might be expressed differently by those who study it. You know, Terry Johnson speaks about it as a pattern of praise and confession, the means of grace, which include both word and sacrament, and then blessing. But no matter how it is expressed differently, the essential core is always the same. God always draws near to his people by first calling them to praise him. And as they draw near, they see their own sinfulness as they enter into the presence of a holy God. And they need to be cleansed before him. And he cleanses them. He grants that cleansing to them. Then he gives them his word as a means of great or grace to strengthen them, to make them more holy, to make them more in the image and likeness of God. And then he comes and he communes with his people by way of a meal, showing that his peace has indeed been given to the people of God. And that he is not stingy with his love for his people. He has not withheld it. And then he sends you away in peace. Ought this pattern inform our worship? Because dear Christian, this is, it isn't just the pattern of worship. This is the pattern of your life. This is your identity. This is who you are in Christ as a Christian. It is all wrapped up in this pattern. Your life has been hidden in Christ. This is your story. We gather each week to remember just that, that, is, that uh, who we are, that who we are has been hidden in him. We gather to worship him who has called us out of our sin and wandering. He has cleansed us and now he consecrates us and he communes with us and he commissions us to go out again into the world with his peace upon it. That is what defines you as a people of God. And when you become a Christian, it was uh, God who called you, right? It was him who called you, who set, 
uh, called you indeed to praise him and you responded and you saw God for who he was and you recognized that you were a sinner and needed to confess your sins before him. And then what happened? He cleansed you. He does not withhold his cleansing from you, but he gives it. And then he gives you his word and the Lord's Supper to strengthen you, to make you holy to himself. And he sends us out again from his presence with his blessing upon us as a light to the nations that we might be assured of his peace that is given to us. That is your story, people of God. That is your identity. That is who you are, and it never changes. It's who we are. Every time that we gather to worship before God, this is true of us, and that story is retold again and again. We hear these same things told to us again and again. It becomes a habit ingrained into us that changes who we are and shapes the way we live our lives because of what he has spoken over us. If we have a race to run, dear Christian, that will last all of our days, the people of God, it is most fitting for us to rehear that pattern every week, to feel it in the liturgy, in the order of service, to be told who we are in Christ. Indeed, so that channel may run deep into our brains so that it might shape who we are because of what he has done for us. He's drawn you out of sin. He has called you, people of God. And he has cleansed you of all your unrighteousness, making you more holy each and every day. Sure, it doesn't always look all that great, but that is what he is doing. And he communes with you and he gives you his peace. This is your story. May we embrace that story each week. May that same story that we hear over and over and over again shape who we are this day as we come before our God who keeps covenant with his people. Amen. Let us pray together. Our God, we, we come before you, and what more is there to say? We come before a God who has done something that is unheard of. For surely, Father, we... Uh, Admit that we are sinners and we deserve nothing but your wrath. And yet you give your people grace. You sent your only begotten son in order to draw a people to yourself. And you covenant with them by, the, by his own shed blood. You make a promise that those whom you draw, you will bless. Father, we pray for this people who is gathered. We pray that you would continue to build them up, consecrate them to yourselves. Allow them to know the communion they have with the Father. Father, we pray that you would give them your peace, that you would set it upon them, and that they would know you more fully in all of these things, even through the very basic, simple, ordinary things of life, like an order of worship. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.